Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this next installment, we'll pick up the discussion of pearls, pitfalls, and lessons learned by working through some sample problems and applications. In each instance, we'll take it from the perspective of a student struggling to identify the correct response. So let's get started. And here's our first question. Feel free to pause the recording and work this problem through on your own. But remember, the purpose is to highlight some problem-solving pointers. So step one, wherever possible, make the diagnosis, and then stick with it. This sounds so elementary, but students, for understandable reasons, often waffle on their diagnosis after reading the answer options. We'll explore that in a moment, but first let's start with our premise that data is more important than physical exam, which is more important than verbiage. In this question, the data consists of a heart valve, and they tell us it is the aortic valve, so that's not a mystery. They want us to sort out the pathogenesis of the valvular disorder. On physical exam, he's described with a 3 over 6 systolic murmur at the right upper sternal border, which is the NBME language for aortic stenosis. Got that? 3 over 6 systolic murmur at the right upper sternal border equals aortic stenosis. So we just made the diagnosis. The patient has aortic stenosis. But this is what students do all the time. They look at the answer options, and then they let the options dictate the stem, as in, oh, wait a minute, he has a fever and a heart murmur. This must be endocarditis. But that's not how the game is played. We already made the diagnosis of aortic stenosis, and we're going to stick with it. The stem dictates the diagnosis and not the other way around. I'll beat that point to death several more times because students regularly get beat up by the answer options. But if you just remember the job description of each, you can mitigate the chaos created by the options. So, the job description of the question stem is to offer clues in NBME language to help you generate a working hypothesis or diagnosis, just like you do in clinical medicine. The job of the question options, on the other hand, is to destroy your young minds and sow self-doubt. And if you let them, they will. So if you work from the stem to the options and not the other way around, justice will always triumph over evil. Okay. We have the diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Let's see what else we can pull from the stem. The patient is 74, which might be an important demographic. He has fever, shortness of breath, and lung crackles. They inform us that he is diagnosed with SARS pneumonia and passes away during the hospitalization. The demographics in this case is only used to get us to the autopsy. All right, I already mentioned we don't know the correct answer, so we'll start by listing the typical associations in the briefest of terms. So let's start with acute infectious endocarditis. As a reminder, and I hope you have it in your notes, acute infectious endocarditis is associated with regurgitant murmurs, not stenotic lesions. That is, the vegetations prevent the valves from coapting, so aortic stenosis would not be associated with acute infectious endocarditis. Further, beyond fever, which was already accounted for by the SARS infection, the stem offered no other stigmata or demographic information to support endocarditis, so we can move on from that choice. Listed next are my quick associations with a congenital bicuspid valve, including premature onset of aortic stenosis, perhaps defined by a patient in their fourth or fifth decade. Another common association would be Turner syndrome, which doesn't apply. And finally, I would expect to see a midline raphe and only two cusps. I label the pathology specimen showing three cusps, so we can move on from this choice. For choices three and four, I've grayed them out. I'll remind you that five of the six choices are wrong. I don't obsess on those I can easily eliminate. I need to save time and energy for later. Just be sure when you eliminate an answer option, you have great confidence it is an incorrect response. Choice five, age-related dystrophic calcification, actually fits nicely with the diagnosis, but let's eyeball answer option six post-inflammatory scarring. That should conjure up some unpleasant memories for you, namely from your lectures on rheumatic heart disease. Now, if you can't remember that pathologic description or presentation, feel free to check your notes. Really, it's fine to use your notes while going through the cue banks. You are only doing these practice tests for learning. Looking up the material will help it stick for the next time around. This is a form of spaced repetition. After looking it up, you recall the description and gross pathology rheumatic heart disease and realize that was fun, but it isn't the best answer choice. So you've done all the heavy lifting. You went through the vignette and generated a diagnosis. You synthesized your typical associations with each reasonable answer option. And finally, you will make sure your answer makes sense in the context of the available information 
focusing on what they told you, including the classic murmur and pathology, and what they didn't tell you, including things like splinter hemorrhages and risk factors for endocarditis, etc. And finally, you go back and refine your notes, focusing on the language of age-related aortic stenosis. In this instance, I would make sure I understood the physical exam and pathology. The process of refining your notes will cement and reinforce learning. I will use them again as a reference in future questions, which will further serve to reinforce the lessons. And finally, so you don't think I'm a total whack job, this was a pathology question. I'll keep my focus on pathology. Other important subject matter has a way of recurring, so I would not use this occasion to go nuts on the pressure curves. That is fodder for another subdivision and another time. Okay? Alright, who wants to try another question? Feel free to pause the recording while you work on this question. Again, I advise you these are samples to highlight methods of negotiating a question when the answer isn't immediately apparent. So let's dig in with a reminder that all sentences are not created equally, with data being most important, and of all the data, pathology is king, and that is where we'll launch our discussion. We have a patient identified with a lymphocytic infiltrate within the myocardium, and that infiltrate has caused dilation of the ventricles, resulting in an ejection fraction at 25%. So, by definition, this patient has an acquired, as opposed to inherited, dilated cardiomyopathy. This is your diagnosis, and it can't change no matter what you read in the question options. So here are our options, all of which are associated with cardiac disease. So we'll run the list quickly to see if anything jumps out in favor of the diagnosis or is easily excluded. But in this example, we were uncertain, so let's continue processing the stem. We see that he is 19, and that is in keeping with several diagnoses, although not a typical demographic for amyloidosis. And then we note he is African-American, which raises sarcoidosis in our estimation, but we maintain a healthy skepticism of verbiage. And next we interpret the physical exam, paying attention to the abnormal findings. And in fact, these are all in keeping with a dilated cardiomyopathy, including lung crackles and that early diastolic heart sound at the cardiac apex, with an emphasis on sound reminding you this is an S3 and not a heart murmur. And recall, in questions where the answer is not immediately apparent, think about what they did not tell you in the physical exam. We'll come back to these as we start thinking about our typical associations with each of the answer choices. So here we go. As in other questions, we narrow the answer choices down, but are still not certain of the correct answer. So here is where we play the typical associations game. And although I exaggerate the process, in actual practice, it should be a very quick exercise. So here it goes. For Coxsackie, we have a viral infection. And not much more I can say about that one in terms of typical association. Let's look at the other choices, leaving Coxsackie on the list. Option two is acute rheumatic fever. And I remind you there are five key manifestations defined by the Jones criteria, but the cornerstone is its description as a non-superative complication of strep infection. In this example, you know it can cause carditis, but the pathology is escaping you. He you notes know an immune media disorder and, and lymphocytes might be present, so we have to leave this one on the list. But before moving on, let's make mental note of what they didn't mention in the question stem, including prior strep infection, fleeting polyarthritis, and physical exam findings of subcutaneous nodules and or erythema marginatum. So this option may not represent the most likely diagnosis. As for Kawasaki disease, which is currently in the news as another manifestation of the COVID pandemic, you recall there are five manifestations, which are easy to remember if you use the other description of mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, to include eye, mouth, skin, cervical lymphadenopathy, and fever, plus the disorder is seen in younger children. We also know this medium-sized vasculitis is complicated by coronary artery aneurysms, not dilated cardiomyopathy, so I am comfortable excluding this option. But before moving on, this would be a good example of what I call a derivative of a derivative. There is the occasional student who likes to go a step beyond the facts. They'll reason that if the patient has a coronary artery aneurysm, there must be ischemia and a reduction in the ejection fraction or something along those lines. First of all, suggesting an association with ischemia is a giant leap of faith, and secondly, it has nothing to do with the lymphocytic infiltrate. So be careful of going beyond the boundaries or limits set by the question writer. So let's strike Kawasaki from the list and move on to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What are the typical descriptors for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? 
These typically include young athletes presenting with syncope or sudden cardiac death and associated with the pathologic finding of myocyte disarray. Continuing to focus on what they didn't tell us, in this instance the focus is on the physical exam. No mention of the systolic murmur located at the mid-left sternal border and louder withstanding and valsalva maneuver. And of course, the echo did not report hypertrophic changes. Plus, the biopsy demonstrated a lymphocytic infiltrate, not myocyte disarray. So this is an easy answer to exclude. As for amyloid, the pathogenesis involves the abnormal folding of a protein that gets deposited in the interstitium. Additionally, cardiac amyloid is one of the prototypic restrictive cardiomyopathies, so we can strike that one from the list as well. And as for sarcoidosis, we know the pathologic description is non-caseating granulomas. And this is another example of the question writer using the verbiage of African American for their typical tomfoolery, hoping it would lure you to sarcoidosis in spite of the pathology description. And I'll remind you again that we work from the stem down, not the options up. If you work from the options up, it is easy to say, oh, a young African American who is short of breath and has interstitial lung disease characterized by lung crackles. And we deduce this is a classic sarcoid description. I know this sounds extreme, but once you look at enough questions and enough question options, you start to hallucinate and make things up. I see this all the time. Don't let the options beat you up. So let's put this sample question to rest. We previously decided the stem lacked typical descriptors of acute rheumatic fever beyond the dilated cardiomyopathy, and they offered no strep infection. And as a reminder, the classic pathology for acute rheumatic fever is the Ashoff body. So we've done it again. Another correct answer. We weren't sure about the classic pathology associated with viral myocarditis, but by applying the classic associations and paying attention to what they didn't tell us, we were able to select the most likely diagnosis. And before finishing up, we check our references and or refine our notes, and now we know, once and for all, that an acquired dilated cardiomyopathy is associated with Coxsackie virus infection, and the classic pathology is characterized by a lymphocytic infiltrate. If you wish, you can go back to your Coxsackie notes and see if there are any other exciting tidbits about this virus that are worth cleaning up. And that's how the game is played. So let's stop here and pick up the discussion in the next video presentation with a couple of more samples. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.